Hi, my name is Kim Jacobson. I'm a mom, I'm a wife, I'm a lawyer, and at age 51, I got diagnosed with Parkinson's disease in the middle of a world pandemic. This video is one in a series of video blogs where I'm telling my story about early Parkinson's diagnosis and the things that I've dealt with. In this particular um, episode or chapter, I'm gonna talk about working with Parkinson's disease, and I'm also going to talk about the ADA and the law in regards to getting accommodations for working with Parkinson's disease, or quite frankly, any other kind of disease or disability. Um, I've mentioned before that I'm a lawyer. Um, ironically, I do civil rights law, and one of the things I deal with on a daily basis is issues with people who are asking for reasonable accommodations for a disability. And it's sort of an interesting perspective to now have turned it around and find myself in that very situation. Um, this video is not meant to give you legal advice. I would strongly suggest that if you need an attorney that you consult the local bar association or if you are low income that you contact your local legal services agency. I cannot give you legal advice. I am working for the state and I I'm not uh, able to do that, but I would like to share my knowledge and my story with you. So one sort of silver lining of the pandemic is that when I found out in July um, that I had Parkinson's disease, I was already working from home. Um, and that to me was a true blessing because a lot of the symptoms I was experiencing at the time, um, I had some facial masking, some gait issues, some, a lot of stiffness and a lot of exhaustion. And I think it would have been very difficult to be dealing with those challenges while trying to work and trying to figure out what my next step was. One of the first things I did when I got diagnosed with Parkinson's disease is I signed up through my physical therapist to do an LSVT big program, which is an exercise physical therapy program designed for people with Parkinson's. The problem was is that the physical therapist that I needed to deal with was about 40 minutes away from my home and I needed to go to her for at least an hour, four days a week, and I needed to drive back. So that required taking off uh, quite a bit of time from work for about a four week period. So one of the first things I did was contact my HR department and I was able to get FMLA um, which is the Family Medical Leave app, time off to take that therapy. Um, by doing that, I was, I guess, in a sense, telling my employer that I had Parkinson's disease, but that information never got shared with my supervisor or my manager or even um, higher up people in my organization. It turns out in my particular agency, our HR is handled by a different agency, and so the two kind of didn't mix with each other. Um, and when I started to do these video blogs and talk about my Parkinson's disease, I hadn't yet talked to my manager or the management at my um, work about what was going on with me. And that was for a few reasons. One, I really wasn't sure what I might need, how it might feel to work, what it was going to be like working now that I had this diagnosis, was, were things going to be different, I just didn't know. I also didn't necessarily need anything, so there wasn't a, a reason to say, hey, guess what? I have Parkinson's disease. My husband always says, you don't need to lead with that. And he's right, I don't need to lead with that. Um, and you know, the other issue was that there is some stigma in disclosing it, even in a place where I work, where they would naturally be open to hearing about this diagnosis. You know, I still to this day hesitate a little bit the first time someone finds out I have Parkinson's because what immediately goes through my mind is are they now going to think about me differently because of this diagnosis. Um, so how have things been going working from home? Well, one of the things I had noticed um, before I decided to start taking medic uh, medication is that um, I was having clumsiness with my left hand and I was having some trouble typing. Um, and one of the things that physical therapy helped me with was strengthening that left hand and also focusing on 
pushing down hard on the keys. And I find when I push down hard on the keys, I am very less likely to mess up my computer password. Because you know, if you do that too many times, you just get locked out. It's not a good thing. Um, so I do wonder if some point in the future, maybe an adaptive keyboard or something like that might be helpful. As of now, uh, my hand is stronger, there's less stiffness, and that hasn't been so much of a problem. Um, one thing I have n thought about is right now I'm taking my meds uh, when I wake up, when I go to bed, and at 2 o'clock. And I'm taking it at 2 o'clock because I've tried to time it away from lunch so that it's an hour or so after I would eat any protein um, because the medicine doesn't work well if it's combined with protein. And I do notice if I've been like in a Zoom meeting or something of that nature, I'm very cognizant that at two o'clock I want to turn off my microphone because I don't want everyone hearing and then see me popping a pal. So I've been able to kind of divert my gaze and not had that alarm go off. And I do wonder once I go back to work or when and if we go back to work when I'm dealing with people, should I like try to not make appointments around two o'clock? But with lawyers, it's a little harder because when the court tells you you have to be there, you don't necessarily really have a choice. So that's definitely something I'm going to have to um, deal with when I get back to work. Um, the other thing I've noticed, I did notice that I had a lot of fatigue in the beginning of this diagnosis. Um, and it was kind of nice to be home when that was happening because you could kind of just get up and walk around and you didn't feel like you had to sort of explain yourself. Um, and there was times that I took some sick leave to leave a little bit early. There were some that I took some vacation or PL leave because I just didn't want to kind of alert anyone that I needed to leave early because I was exhausted. Um, that has subsided since I've been well medicated and I'm exercising well and eating better. So I feel good about that. I don't know what it's like going to be like to have to drive into work, work eight hours and drive home if I'm going to feel very differently once that happens. But right now I've been able to put the fatigue at bay, luckily. Uh, and then occasionally after work now, I just kind of shut my eyes for a few minutes, 15 minutes and set an alarm. And it seems to be enough to kind of get me through the rest of the evening. Um, one thing I definitely have noticed is stress makes any of the symptoms worse. So I had done um, a radio interview on the phone. It's not something I do all the time, but I was talking about a legal issue on the radio. And I noticed like my face was kind of twitching and I thought to myself, really hope and happy this is a radio interview and not an in-person interview. But I do worry about, you know, sort of people noticing as I get anxious, if I'm making an oral argument in court or if I'm dealing with witnesses or whatever I'm doing, if um, people are going to notice my symptoms, sort of like wearing your heart on your sleeve, right? You get nervous and then the twitching gets worse and then you're twitching more and then you get more nervous. So I'm trying to work on deep breathing and meditation. It's not something I'm very good at, but I'm trying to sort of just breathe it in and try to kind of relax because I know the worse my anxiety gets, the worse my symptoms are going to get. Um, I do notice a little bit of brain fog now and then, a little bit of, it's a little bit harder to multitask. It's sometimes a little bit difficult to find the right words, and it's really hard for me to determine whether that is normal age, stress related to living in a pandemic, stress related to living in a pandemic and being diagnosed with Parkinson's disease or the Parkinson's disease itself. Um, when we got assigned to work from home, there was all of a sudden a vast amount of technology which we never used before. I was like a big, probably, not environmentally sound, but I would print a lot of things out and write on them before the pandemic. Now I don't have that easily um, access to a printer, so I'm doing things online. And definitely I found that all this technology has been a little bit challenging for me. And I guess we'll just see, and does it really matter whether it's the Parkinson's disease or the pandemic or the stress or what it is? If I end up needing help from my employer, I'm going to tell them. And I have started to use my voice and say, I'm noticing I'm not the only one having trouble with this technology. There's other people having trouble with technology. So maybe we could kind of like dumb this down for everybody a little bit. So I've become more comfortable saying that now. Um, so I want to talk about disclosure because I know some people will work and never tell anyone at work that they have Parkinson's disease. And I sort of took a layered approach or 
a sequential approach, maybe you can say. So when I was first diagnosed, I have one or two really good work friends that I told what was going on. And then as the weeks went by and I was kind of feeling overwhelmed and the people near me who I felt close to, I said, you know what, I'm just going to tell my coworkers that I'm friends with about what's going on. So there was a little bit bigger group of people that I shared the diagnosis with. And the thing I noticed is that the more I shared, the more positivity I got, the more support I got, the more understanding I got of what I was going through. And at this time, I'm not the only one who's stressed out because we're living a pandemic and I have colleagues who are working at home with their little kids trying to ask for uh, snacks at the same time. So everyone has a lot going on and I just felt like sharing my story and what was going on actually just made it easier to be much more my genuine self. But I was still nervous about telling my manager and about the management at my office. Um, and like I said, when I started doing these videos, I hadn't told them yet. Um, but the more I've put these videos out and I've now been asked to speak publicly about this, um, the more I feel like I want to live my most genuine life. And so a few weeks ago, I sat down um, virtually with my boss and my boss's boss, and I said, listen, I have Parkinson's disease. I'm not asking for anything right now, but I'm doing some public speaking about it, and I'm putting out video blogs, and I would really hate for you to find out about this via the internet rather than me telling you directly. And I told them that I was good and I was healthy and I was fine and I didn't think I needed anything, but that if I needed anything, I would tell them. And they were really super supportive and great. Um, and I think I just had so much anxiety built up to tell people about this because after all, it is a brain disease. And so especially someone who is a professional who is doing complex, um, complex things, <laughs> complex things, you know, sometimes you, the first thing you don't want people to think about is her brain is broken. And so I'd rather that them think of me as a competent uh, attorney, uh, which I believe I still am. Um, so for me, I did disclose it was about seven or eight months after I got the initial diagnosis. I am wondering what my work life will be like after the pandemic, and I guess we'll just see. I'm trying to take things one day at a time and not really focus too much on the future, but just sort of enjoy the today and how things are going for me now. Um, I thought I would talk a little bit also in this video blog about employment discrimination and the ADA because it is the work that I do and it seems like a waste for me to have this knowledge and not share it with you or some people may need this uh, information. So if a person in the United States is treated differently because of their disability, for instance, say, um, someone comes in to uh, apply for a job and they have a tremor and the employer just assumes either that they have a disease or that quite frankly they have a drug problem or uh, if they having, that they think they have anxiety and decide they don't want to hire them because of that. That's an example of employment discrimination, failure to hire uh, you know, or take some action against someone because they are disabled. So that would be a legal discrimination and that person can file a complaint. Um, typically you would have to file a complaint with your lo local civil rights agency or the EEOC and then you can go to court thereafter if you'd like to. Um, there's also a portion of the federal law, the ADA, which allows for a person with a disability to actually be treated differently to ask for accommodations to help them with that disability. So for instance, if I am a person in a wheelchair and there is a desk at work that is not high enough, I can ask my employer to raise that desk. That would be an example of a reasonable accommodation to provide some kind of um, supportive um, work space for you. Um, sometimes there is something that you want your employer to change in terms of a policy. So it might be that you need to take your meds exactly at 8 a.m. and work typically starts at 8 a.m. and you can ask to start at 8.30 and to work a half hour later. That would be an example of a reasonable accommodation as well. Um, like I said, there's no requirement for you to tell your employer that you have Parkinson's disease or any other disability for that matter, unless you need something from them. 
So if you're working and everything's fine and you don't need anything from them, the disclosure is really a personal issue. It's not a legal issue whether you have to disclose. However, if you need something, you're gonna have to disclose. And I wouldn't wait to disclose until things got so bad that you should have asked for something and you hadn't. So it's not gonna go well if you're having trouble with your executive functioning and you are a secretary at work and you're missing deadlines, things are typed incorrectly, things are photocopied wrong, and then you're about to get fired and you're getting, uh, you know, they're about to hand you the pink slip and you said, no, 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 I have Parkinson's disease, you need to accommodate me. It could very well be too late if you wait that long. So if you're gonna feel like you're gonna need things, then I would say you wanna disclose beforehand before you get, you're in a pickle. Um, and I would say from personal experience, you have to know your workplace and how it's gonna be accepted in terms of disclosure when you don't legally need to disclose. So I had a sense because of the work I do that I work in a civil rights agency that I would be treated well. Uh, and I chose to disclose and I still in the back of my mind know my rights and know that if I ever need um, to take action, I would know what to do. Um, but I don't anticipate needing to do that. Um, if you do ask for a reasonable accommodation, they can ask for a medical note. It doesn't necessarily have to be from a doctor. It can be from a nurse practitioner. It might be from a physical therapist. It might be from a therapist, a psychiatrist, whoever the doctor is that's treating you for the thing you need the accommodation for. And the doctor doesn't have to disclose your whole medical history. They just have to give your employer enough information so that they would have what they need in, in order to understand what accommodations you would need and to be able to accommodate you. So for instance, they don't have to, you know, hand over your DAT scan or hand over the dosage of medication you're taking. If you need some kind of organizational um, software, uh, your doctor would simply write a note, I'm treating my patient for a neurological disease. She requires um, software to assist her with her executive functioning. If you have any questions, please let me know. And a note like that would probably be sufficient. Um, I was, so what happens when you ask um, your employer, so say in this example, you wanted some organizational software and there's software that costs $10,000 and you looked it up and you found out this is the best organizational software. It's gonna give me tabs and calendars and it's gonna combine my email and do all these whistles and bells and it'll give me extra fonts on my computer and emojis and all sorts of things. And the employer looks and said, that is a really good software, but we think for $2,000, there's this other software that really meets all your needs as well. And so you go back and forth and explain what you need and figure out what the employer wants to give and, it, and that's how it goes. The employer isn't gonna necessarily give you your Cadillac of accommodations. Um, they just need to give you an accommodation that's gonna help you meet the need that you have. So I did some, oh, and the other thing I definitely wanted to mention that you still have to be qualified for the job even with or without the accommodations. So in other words, if you need the accommodation of this software, but once you get the software, you still can't do your job, you're still mistyping things, you're still messing up the photocopies, then you're probably not gonna be able to retain the job. But if you get the software and it helps you with your organizational issues, then you've been accommodated and you're qualified for that job. So I looked up some examples of um, accommodations that people with Parkinson's might need. So one thing is that people with Parkinson's have stamina issues and fatigue issues. And so, you know, normally a grocery store clerk might um, have to stand all day, but maybe if you have Parkinson's, you can ask to use a stool or have some kind of anti-fatigue mats. Um, lots of times people with Parkinson's disease have executive functioning issues, memory loss, mental confusion, organizational issues, and there's lots of computer apps um, that are helpful that might help people with Parkinson's disease do their task, or you might just ask for a little extra time to do the tasks. Um, in terms of tremors and weaknesses, there's keyboard aids, there's speech recognition software, there's adaptable desks that might help people. Um, in terms of a stress intolerance issue with Parkinson's disease, maybe you could modify your schedule, maybe you could take breaks 
not at the break time, but as you need break times, in terms of taking your medication, maybe you could have more flexibility in your breaks, maybe you could have a private area to take your medication. I mean, the possibilities are endless. I would suggest that if you are looking for um, ideas about accommodate, asking for accommodations, or if you're an employer looking for ideas about accommodating folks with PD, um, there's a great website, jan.org, J-A-N. This is a nonprofit website, I believe, and I'm not affiliated with them, um, but it's where I go when I have cases and I wanna see what kind of accommodations are available for various disabilities, and also get a really great explanation of lots of different disabilities. Um, so that's really a very, very quick primer on the ADA and discrimination law. And I would suggest again that if you have questions, contact a lawyer or contact a legal services provider. They would really be in the best um, place to give you advice on your specific situation. But what I do want to say is I think that there's, there's hope that there's hope for me that I can continue to work and that if I need an accommodation that I'll be able to ask for one. And there's hope for others who wish to keep working during their journey. I hope this has been useful to you and have a great day. Peace and love.